Hello everyone, this is Medicine in 3 Minutes, and today we're going to be talking about the blood-brain barrier. So in 1885, Dr. Paul something, sorry I can't pronounce his last name here, decided to inject tripen blue um, in a mouse. And when he did so, he noticed that um, the body and its systems were all stained in blue, except for the central nervous system and the peripheral nerves that usually would stick out right here. And obviously that raised the question of why didn't the coloring agent stain the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system? And that obviously led us to the blood-brain barrier. So a quick little definition is that it's the selective semi-permeable membrane barrier that separates the circulating blood from the brain. So semi-permeable obviously means that um, it uh, allows only a few things in. So through passive diffusion, water and liposoluble molecules can get in, no problem. Um, it does not let in uh, lipophilic neurotoxins, and uh, via selective transport, uh, glucose and amino acids can find their way in. And when we say selective, selective is that they must uh, mean, uh, meet certain criteria. So uh, functions of the blood-brain barrier um, is that it stabilizes the microenvironment of uh, the neuron. It protects uh, the neurotoxins uh, to enter the central nervous system. It maintains neurotransmitters within the central nervous system. Um, so neurotransmitters think um, dopamine, acetylcholine, uh, serotonin, etc. It mostly wants them inside the central nervous system as opposed to roaming free in the body. And it prevents free movements of chemicals from the blood circulation to enter the central nervous system. So in order to understand how the blood-brain barrier works, we have to understand um, how the capillaries function and their anatomy. So in the body, we have uh, three different kinds of capillaries. We have continuous capillaries, fenestrated capillaries, and sinusoidal capillaries. So the continuous um, are found in the central nervous system. So that is the brain, the spine, and the nerves. You also find them in muscles. Fenestrated are found in the endocrine system and the kidney glomeruli. And the sinusoidal are found in the spleen and the liver. So now looking at the capillaries of the nervous system. So in this picture, you will notice a continuous capillary and a fenestrated capillary. So in the blood-brain barrier, we're talking continuous capillary. Now I repeat that, the blood-brain barrier. Now this fenestrated capillary picture right next to it is only for um, contracts and, compar and comparison purposes. And I put the stress on this because in a few slides, we will be talking about the blood and cerebrospinal fluid barrier, and that calls for fenestrated capillaries. But for the blood-brain barrier, we're talking continuous capillaries. So in the continuous capillaries, you'll notice that there is the existence of tight junctions. So the tight, junction, tight junctions are these green dots, and they're usually in between the endothelial cells, and what they do is that they um, line the capillary and they prevent paracellular transport. So paracellular transport is a transport in between two cells. Transcellular transport is very poor and there is an absence of fenestrations. So these kind of go hand in hand. So the absence of fenestrations here, so fenestrations what they do is that they allow for vesicular transport. And because there is no fenestrations, there is no transcellular transport. Also, the nature of the basal membrane is continuous. Sorry, this should be basal, not basement. My apologies. So that provides a smooth lining. There's also a uh, presence of pig glycoproteins that are ATP uh, energy dependent, and their function is to guard or drive out liposoluble neurotoxins. And then there's astrocytes. So astrocytes are basically a reinforcement for the tight junctions. Tight junctions are these tight knots in between endothelial cells. So say the knot wears out or is not as tight as it used to be, the astrocyte will jump in to provide uh, more tightness. And then if the astrocyte fails, then it will call for clodine and oclidine molecules to re reinforce sorry, that cell tightness. So to summarize what I just said in the previous cells, uh, previous slide, sorry, uh, we have the tight junctions. So these knots right here, they're in between the endothelial cells. So this little blue dot represents an endothelial cell. You have another one right next to it, and the tight junction will be in between. The continuous capillary is, um, is continuous, obviously, and there's the basal lamina, and there's no fenestrations. 
uh, transitosis is absent, so that is vesicular transport and such. B glycoproteins, so no lipo-soluble uh, neurotoxins, and astrocytes to reinforce our tight junctions. So overall summary, blood-brain barrier means proteins are out, polar molecules are out, neurotoxins are out. What's in? Small, tiny little molecules, um, small liposoluble molecules, water, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. Now think blood-brain barrier is in, um, involves continuous capillaries. Now we're going to talk about the blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier. So we're going to take a look at the little anatomy of the brain ventricles here. So you have two lateral ventricles. Uh, the right lateral ventricle and the left lateral ventricle. You have the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle here. And what's connecting the third and fourth ventricles is the Sylvius aqueduct. And this little gap right here in between the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle is what we call the choroid plexus. And the choroid plexus is composed of ependymal cells. And basically, these ependymal cells are what produces the cerebrospinal fluid. So all the spinal fluid that you see running down from your brain all the way to your spine is produced in this um, little, um, I guess, cavity between the lateral, um, the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle. So the blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier calls for fenestrated capillaries. So in order to understand the transfer between the blood and cerebrospinal fluid, we have to understand the structure of the capillaries in the choroid plexus. So the fenestrations here, they allow for intracellular transport. The absence of tight junctions allows for paracellular transport. So both types of transports are possible. These side junctions here that you see, they do not belong in the capillaries. They're not on the capillaries. They're actually on the um, choroid epithelial cells. And among the uh, ependymal cells lining the ventricle, there are these modified cells called choroid epithelial cells. And the modification is that they have, they come equipped with tight junctions. So unlike the capillaries that form the blood-brain barrier, the choroid plexus capillaries are fenestrated and they don't have any tight junctions, tight junctions. So the endothelium does not form a barrier to the movement of small molecules. And instead, the blood CSF barrier at the choroid plexus is formed by the epithelial cells uh, linked by the tight junctions right here. So keep in mind, the tight junctions are not on the fenestrated capillary. They're actually on the choroid um, cell lining here. So quick little overview. Blood CSF barrier calls for fenestrated capillary. Blood brain barrier calls for continuous capillary. Fenestrated capillaries do not have tight junctions. Tight junctions are on the continuous capillaries. So one last little thing, and that is glucose. So what about glucose? So don't forget that 90% of the energy used by your brain is in the form of glucose. But you notice that glucose is both polar and large, which means it should not be able to get in. Well, what facilitates the entry of glucose to the brain is GLU-1. Now, it's very important that when you spell GLU-1, you have this dash and you have this Roman numerical, not a 1 as in a, a digital number, like the Roman uh, 1. And another thing to keep in mind about GLU-1 is that it's insulin independent. So that is your body usually, so say you decide to fast um, one day and then the next day you decide to eat a lot of sugar, well, what's going to regulate your glucose level in your bodies are the insulin. Well, your brain doesn't like things like that. It doesn't like big variations. So that's why it calls for GLU-1, which is completely insulin independent, so that your brain can still function on glucose. 
we hope you enjoyed the video and we hope you check out Butcher Gardens um, in person if you can. And if not, you can check out our book on uh, Amazon. This is Medicine in Three Minutes. Um, I do understand the irony. We went definitely way over the, 15 min uh, the three minutes there. Uh, but we hope uh, this uh, video help you, uh, helps you understand the blood-brain barrier. Thank you.